You know, one great thing about living on the coast is flying an airplane along the beach. You can come along and look at the million dollar houses and imagine how the other half lives. I try to do it once or twice a week. And it shouldn't be escaping notice that a beach is a great emergency landing runway. It might not be that wide, but it's plenty long. The only thing is, if you're not careful about it, you could kill somebody landing an airplane on the beach, and that actually happened on this very beach a few years ago. I'll get to the details in a minute, but the upfront message is this. If you botch the landing, pitch pull the airplane, rip the wheels off of it, you're still likely to survive an emergency beach landing. You can't necessarily say the same thing for the people on the ground, though. So beach landings are no big deal. The guys with the Tundra tires do them by the thousands. If not on real beaches, then on river sandbars. Same thing, just shorter. Those are power on landings, of course, not emergency landings. If you're doing this as an emergency power off landing, it's still just a landing. But think of it as a soft field landing, which means you want to touch down at the slowest possible speed, so it will reduce the likelihood of a nose over. But the setup requires some thinking. Since the wind is rarely parallel to the beach, plan on a quartering crosswind. Here on the Gulf Coast, the sea breeze blows in the morning and late in the day it reverses to a land breeze. Determine the quartering direction the way you usually would by looking at smoke drift or ripples on sheltered water. Beaches aren't always unobstructed. They can be bisected by groins and jetties, docks and seawalls. Those usually aren't a problem because you can look down the beach and see most of that stuff. What you might not see are people. There are people on this beach, some walking in the sand, some waving. How far away do you think they are? About 500 feet. They would come into better view when you make the turn to line up for an approach, but by the time you see them, it may be too late to do anything about it, if you even see them at all. If they're facing away from you, they won't see you either. And that's what happened in the accident on this beach in 2014. Pilot of an archer was on his way into Venice, my home airport, when he lost engine power and the beach appeared to be the only or at least the best option. He landed in the water as close inshore as he could. But there were people on the beach and the pilot either couldn't see or couldn't avoid a father and his young daughter waiting in the surf and the airplane struck them when he touched down. As you can see, this beach is really not very wide and even for an airplane as small as an archer, there aren't a lot of places to put it down. And even when the beach isn't this narrow, it can still be hard to see people who may be sunning themselves, swimming in the surf or running, and that's exactly what happened in this accident. This accident occurred in 2010 when a Lance Air Experimental lost an engine over the Atlantic and glided to an emergency landing on a beach in South Carolina. Pilot's windshield was covered in oil so he couldn't see a jogger running in the opposite direction who he struck and killed. But there is almost always another option. And that's ditching the airplane just offshore within an easy swim of shallow water. Before you do that, think about this. Just because the beach is an easy glide, it doesn't mean there aren't better options, like a nearby shore road or maybe an area like this open field. Try not to fixate on the beach just because it's your first choice. The pilot of the Archer told NTSB investigators he was reluctant to ditch beyond the breaker line because he was worried the airplane would flip over. That is an understandable fear but it belies one absolute fact every pilot should know before attempting a beach landing. If the beach is too crowded or it's obstructed, ditching just offshore is highly survivable, like 90% survivable. Ditchings aren't as common as they once were, but they're still up to about a dozen or more a year. When I assembled a database of 179 of these accidents a decade ago, I found that 64% of them were ocean inshore ditchings, in other words, just off the beach. 12% were in deep blue water ocean ditchings, and the rest were lakes and rivers. The survival rate for inshore ditching was 88%, basically 9 in 10. And survival here means at least one person got out of the airplane and survived. It's about the same for lakes, but a little higher for rivers. The report suggests the unsurvivable accidents were more crashes than controlled water landings. 
So the survival rate is probably higher than 9 and 10. Pilots worry about not being able to get out of the airplane after it goes into the water or that it will sink like a stone. This has happened, but it's almost too rare to factor into the risk matrix. Flipping or pitch polling is also a demon for many pilots. Again, it does happen, but the egress rate, the ability to get out of the airplane, is 92%. Getting trapped and going down with the ship is rare. Remember, when that airplane hits the water, one thing kicks in right away, adrenaline-fueled motivation. You can improve your already high egress odds by remembering a few things. First, get the seat belts as tight as you can stand them, for everyone. Secure any loose objects as best you can. If possible, open a door. It's unlikely to get jammed on impact, but opening it will prevent that and allow the airplane to partially flood so the door will be easier to open fully for egress. It's not uncommon for windshields to cave in and flood the cabin almost instantly. Be ready for what's called cold water gasp, the reflexive tendency to inhale deeply when exposed to a cold dunking. Wait until the airplane comes to a complete stop, then open the door first, then release the seat belt, not the other way around. Remaining belted in gives you purchase you might need to open the door. Keep your wits about you on the touchdown. Speed equals energy, and the less you have of that, the lower the likelihood of a flip over or a violent landing. Use full flaps and touchdown as slowly as possible. A drop in from a few feet is better than a fast skip, regardless of what kind of airplane you're flying. It's a misconception that high wing airplanes are more likely to flip than low wings. Out of the 179 ditchings, only one flip, according to the accident data. But the accident reports often lack detail and sometimes the pilots can't even remember what happened. So the real number of flip overs is probably higher. Doesn't matter. The overall survival rate is the same. In fact, high wing airplanes were underrepresented in the fatal accidents. High wings were involved in 49% of the ditchings, but only 27% of the fatalities. This is what an almost textbook offshore ditching looks like. The pilot survived. No one on shore was hurt. It happened off Ocean City, Maryland last year. Did you catch the mistake the pilot made? We'll come back to that. And anyway, landing on the beach isn't always a picnic either. Two weeks after the Archer crash in Venice, this pit's put down on a beach near Sarasota, a few miles north. Obviously, it flipped on landing. Both people got out with only minor injuries. This is pretty typical of why they flip. The nose whale digs into the soft sand and over you go. Well, this time, not quite. This super cub towing banners landed and nosed over on a beach in California after the engine quit. Minor injury because the airplane struck someone walking on the beach. You can reduce the chance of a flip over in a nose gear airplane by holding that elevator full nose up, as long as you can until the airplane stops, just like you're supposed to do in a soft field landing. When pilots discuss ditching in a retractable gear airplane, you'll hear some of them say authoritatively to leave the gear up. Others say put the wheels down. I say the data shows it doesn't make any measurable difference because ditchings are almost always successful. Back to the Ocean City ditching. This is a 172 RG and the pilot ditched with the wheels up. Had he lowered the gear, it would have been a straight leg 172 and pilots ditch them all the time and survive. And the mistake he made? No flaps. Definitely always use flaps in a ditching. This pilot of an RV7 made the same mistake landed fast and flipped. He had just been involved in a mid-air collision and may have been too rattled to remember the flaps, or the aircraft may have been damaged. He still survived with minor injuries. What about going for the beach in a retractable gear airplane? Gear up or gear down? I don't know. Not enough accident reports to see a pattern. My gut feel is to leave the gear up, but use full flaps. So now the takeaways from all this. First, both beach landings and ditchings near the beach are highly survivable, probably close to 100%. So I see a couple of ways to look at this. One, when the emergency occurs, make ditching the go-to plan. 
Then as you get nearer to landing and the beach looks good, just do a simple side step and land on the sand. Or reverse it. Make the beach plan A and side steps to the water if there are people about. The point is, don't be afraid of the water. Yeah, you'll need a new airplane and your iPhone will be trash, but that's better than killing or injuring someone on the beach. The burden of that will stay with you for a long time. One last observation. This cub of ours is 82 years old. The engine is newer, but not much. It can run on regular old car gas or on 100 low lead av gas. If I ran it on car gas, it would save me about seven or eight bucks an hour. And to do that legally, I need a piece of paperwork all pilots know as an STC or supplemental type certificate. Costs about 80 bucks. Now, I could just fuel the thing with car gas without getting the STC and no one would know and no one would say a thing. But I don't do that because it goes to attitude and what I call consciousness of safety. This beach landing occurred last summer on the west coast. As you can see, it was kind of a rough one. Both occupants survived, but with injuries. During the investigation, the NTSB found that the airplane hadn't had an annual inspection in three years. The pilot had no medical, and he hadn't had a 24-month flight review in five or six years. All of these things are legally required. The investigation found not a drop of fuel in the airplane, the pilot apparently having run out of gas. Was this related to the other fairly big things the pilot had just skipped over? Who knows? But the opposite of consciousness of safety is complacency. And if you suffer from that, you could wind up on a beach with no beard, no umbrella, no towels, but a broken airplane. For AvWeb, I'm Paul Bertarelli. Thanks for watching.